Dr. Bonson, may we now have your 10-minute opening statement. I have a great appreciation for my opponent's feistiness that he wants to uh, continue to show, you know, he has the sharp tongue and can issue these challenges to God and so forth. But I am still waiting for proof of the kind of, you know, things that he just throws out there on his own authority that there can't be a hell because of this reason he can superimpose his values and so forth. I want you to notice something about what's going on in the debate here tonight. Uh, in the first place, Mr. Tabish has not yet understood the challenge that's been directed to him. He has very little time left to deal with it. I hope that he'll use it when, the, when it does come. In my opening remarks, I pointed out that the inductive principle needs a rational foundation and that we use the inductive principle when we reason, when we engage in discourse, when we do anything to make our experience intelligible. Everything Mr. Tabish has been saying tonight, all of his reasoning, all of his argumentation, fallacious or not, all of it has assumed the inductive principle that there's a uniformity in nature. That is not the design argument. So I hope that he gets to the debate tonight and catches up with what's going on because no one is arguing the teleological argument tonight. Your opponent is arguing that those who argue against the teleological argument and those who argue in favor of it, those who argue against God and those who argue for God, everyone who argues assumes the uniformity of nature and the inductive principle and we haven't been given a rational foundation for that. In fact, the inductive principle is contrary to the atheist view of the universe. So atheists continue to reason, continue to draw on past experience and to draw conclusions from past uh, uh, connections and that sort of thing, and yet they have no basis for believing that they have the right to do that. I'm just waiting for an explanation. It hasn't been given. When you appeal to sensory experience, you beg the question. By the way, better atheist philosophers than Mr. Tavish have already pointed that out. Hume and uh, Bertrand Russell both pointed out you can't appeal to experience to prove the uniformity of nature. Why? Because the appeal to experience already assumes the uniformity of nature. Now, as you consider the background worldviews of atheism or Christian theism, I want you to observe that the life of the atheist is riddled with inconsistency and thus is exposed as being utterly irrational. Atheist will presuppose human dignity and attend the funeral of a friend or uh, to honor a relative, even a child with Down syndrome, but then they will turn around and argue that man has no dignity, is no different than any other product of evolution, like a snail or a dog or a horse. I don't see how they bring these two things together. The atheist will insist that man is nothing more than a complex of biochemical factors controlled by the laws of physics and yet he kisses his wife and his children when he goes home as though there is something called love that each of us share in the family. The atheist will argue that in sexual relations anything goes, there are no moral absolutes, don't impose your views on others. He'll even defend prostitution, but then indignantly condemn child molesters or morally repudiate necrophilia. You see, I don't, the atheist is just a bundle of contradictions. He can't bring his worldview into harmony with itself. He'll suggest that things which happen in the universe happen randomly. It just is that way, arbitrarily. Talk about primitive thinking. That's far more primitive than anything you can find, even in the time the Bible was written. It just happened. But then he'll turn around and he looks for regularities and law-like explanations of events. He looks for uniformity and predictability in the things that he studies in natural science. You see, the atheist doesn't have a workable worldview. He may go on and on autobiographically about how he doesn't like the God of the Bible and doesn't like the doctrine of hell and all that, but he doesn't have a workable worldview in terms of which to reason in the first place, to argue at all, and he exposes its weaknesses at every turn in his life. You see, you can claim that there is nothing spiritual, nothing immaterial, nothing abstract and universal, that only concrete particular things exist. You can claim that events are just random, that there's no personal plan or control or purpose in the universe. You can claim that reality amounts to nothing more but matter in motion. But you can't act or reason in that way. And as long as Mr. Tabish continues to reason 
as long as he continues to assume the uniformity of past experience with what he's saying now, what conclusions he draws scientifically, how he makes his experience intelligible, he's not living in terms of his own assertion about the nature of reality. We have to ask the atheist, why should you be rational? I mean, if man doesn't have a mind, he's just, you know, just has a brain that's subject to the laws of chemistry and physics, then there is no objective reasoning and there's no freedom, actually, for us to consider evidence in an argument and choose one way or another. You know, just like weeds grow, so the mind of man does whatever it does by the laws of physics. We have to ask the atheist, where is the origin of life? On the evolutionary hypothesis, we are led to the irrational view that uh, life spontaneously generated. And yet science today, all of biological science, proceeds on the opposite assumption that spontaneous generation is wrong, as a matter of fact. You know, no matter how much you tinker or work with a cake mix, you're not going to get the cake mix to make a political constitution. No matter how much you tinker with the cake mix, you're not going to get it to make a dream of a spring day. Why is that? Because the elements of a cake mix have nothing to do with what we're talking about when we talk about political constitutions and dreams and so forth. These are different kinds of things. Similarly, inorganic matter doesn't, by a mechanical reconfiguration, give rise to organic things. That kind of thinking is mythical. It's going back to the days of alchemy. But that's what the atheist worldview leaves us with. We don't know why we should be rational. We can't understand the origin of life. On the atheist worldview, why should we think in terms of scientific inference? This is what I keep driving at. If you're a materialist, there is no uniformity in nature. There is no answer to Hume's skepticism, in which case the atheist can't assert anything, even that he doesn't like God. Why should we uh, be moral in terms of the atheist universe? On a naturalistic principle, there is no right or wrong. There's just might. There's just what happens. You can't find obligatory authority anywhere in the world if it's just matter in motion. You see, the atheist just cannot answer the tough questions of philosophy. He cannot make intelligible use of his rationality, of scientific inference, of moral obligation. Now, of course, some atheists will say, well, we don't need to answer that. Reality is simply this way. That is to say, he wants to be arbitrary. Well, if you're going to be arbitrary, don't bother to debate, to say, I'm going to say whatever I want to say. Or sometimes atheists will say, no answer is possible to those deep philosophical questions. No one can know for sure. Of course, that's self-contradictory, isn't it? If no one can know for sure, then how do you know that no one can know for sure? <laughs> Basically, what atheists end up saying is that, well, everybody knows nature is uniform. Everybody knows there's moral absolutes. Everybody knows these things. And you know what? On that point, I agree with the atheist. Everybody does know these things. But the problem is they don't comport with atheism. These things that people know very well, the continuing evidence that you need a Christian theistic worldview to make sense out of experience, these things don't comport with atheism. Key philosophical questions are answered by atheists arbitrarily and inconsistently in a way which can't make sense out of ordinary human experience and reasoning. And atheists try to hide this gaping defect in their theorizing from themselves, but it's not being hid from you tonight. I want you to consider a parallel. A person who were to come tonight and argue no air exists continues to breathe air, doesn't he, while he argues. And when I point out that if, as he says, no air exists, he couldn't be breathing, it would be intellectually inept for him to respond, no, you're wrong to say my theory implies I couldn't be breathing because, in fact, I am breathing. You see, he would be so self-deluded that he wouldn't catch the significance of the fact that the facts belie his theory. And the facts, the most common facts of life, inductive reasoning, scientific conclusions, moral judgments, making experience intelligible, belie the theory of atheism. Intellectually speaking, atheists continue to breathe. I know that. They continue to reason, to be scientific, to make moral judgments. I don't doubt that. But the atheistic view of things would, in theory, make such breathing impossible, would render science arbitrary, logic impossible, and ethics nonsense. Atheists work hard to hide this intellectual poverty from themselves. That's why they look up verses in the Bible and try to ridicule things, rather than getting down to the basic issue of do you have a philosophy of life in terms of which you can reason about anything at all? 
And they pretend, philosophically speaking, that they're not breathing God's air all the time. They're arguing against him. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17 said to the philosophers in ancient Greece, in him, in God, we live and move and have our existence. You see, God is the very atmosphere of our lives. Thank you, Dr. He's the Austin. intellectual precondition of all of our rationality and all of our morality. Thank you, Dr. Bonson.